Well, thank you all for braving this lovely weather we're having. We feel very cold and rest here. It's blowing and awful. Um, and we're so happy to be able to welcome Elizabeth Willis, who's a graduate student at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Um, this Center for Archaeological Research and yes, that is a mouthful to say, Elizabeth. Very much. But um, she's um, been doing some work on three collections and looking at what they say about trade and just getting a little bit further deeper into life and language colonies. So we're really fa we were fascinated to be able to um, have her come here today and make this presentation. We've just had a week of third grade. <laughs> but they are loving the archaeology exhibit, which if you haven't had a chance to see it, you know, we definitely want to But it's a little cold and dark in there now, so we'll pick a better day. But to come back and see it, um, it's, it's getting there, a lot of excitement and seeing the enthusiasm from you know, even the, the third graders, Stephen, has, who's, was our guest curator here, um, it's just been remarkable. And they just can't believe it was really John and you know, really related to John and Priscilla. So we're excited to learn more about the Pilgrim story. We'll let Elizabeth give us a wonderful presentation. Okay. And I'm going to hang out right over here so that I can navigate through this. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yes. Perfect. So, again, welcome. I'm really happy that people came out on this very, very windy and chilly day. Um, today I'm going to be talking about my thesis research, which looks at three different sites. So you can see we are right here at the Alden First site, it's just down the way a little bit. I'm also looking at the Allerton Prince Cushman site in Kingston, Massachusetts, and POYBH, which is Plymouth Burial Hill. So if any of you are familiar with the work that David Landon and Krista Veronica are doing in downtown Plymouth, that is that site right there. I apologize if any of this is repetitive. Before I talk about my research, I just want to do a bit of a history of the founding of Plymouth, where these sites come from, and then talk about how the sites were discovered and the research that's been done on them so far. So, pilgrims, when you think about them, a lot of people think of the Thanksgiving plays, the buckles, the dark clothing, the very religious group of people very conservative. It's been built up over the past 400 years into this national narrative that James Deeds called the Pilgrim Myth. But of course, when you look at that a little more closely, when you look at the original documents, when you look at the archaeological materials that are there, the picture gets a lot more complicated than that simple picture of this kind of a stereotype almost. There we go, it took a second to click through. So, of course, the pilgrims were a group of separatists who believed that the Church of England was impure, and they wanted to create a pure, more traditional form of the church. So they wanted to actually break off from the Church of England. This was actually a capital crime at the time of the colonies. So, in 1608, Separatists from Scrooby in Nottinghamshire, England, decided to move to Leiden in the Netherlands, where there was more religious tolerance. By 1609, there were 125 members of the Scrooby congregation in Leiden, but unfortunately, Bradford cites that they were having difficulties with upward mobility, they were having trouble finding jobs, and also they were very worried about the evil examples that their children were facing and their children becoming more Dutch than English. So because of this, they decided to move from Leiden <coughs> to the Virginia colony. <coughs> Excuse me. So they actually sent a couple of members of their congregation to England in order to petition for a patent, which became known as the First Pierce Patent. This gave them permission to settle within the colony of Virginia, and they started gathering people up, and in 1620, they set out on two ships, one of which was the Mayflower. The other one, unfortunately, had to turn back due to some mechanical issues, almost. And because of that, the Mayflower was loaded up with as many people as they could get, and sent off 
to the new world. Now, unfortunately, they got a little bit sidetracked and ended up actually outside of the bounds of the Virginia colony. And because of that, they created an interstitial form of government, which is famously known as the Mayflower Compact. They also sent word back to England in order to petition to receive an additional patent known as the Second Pierce Patent. That gave them seven years in which to really establish and build up a colony. If they survived that seven years, they would be allowed to petition for a more permanent patent. Now, the original Plymouth colony was settled on top of Burial Hill, um, and it actually stretched all the way from the top of Burial Hill down to the harbor. There is a record of the planning of this colony in Mort's Relation, which is right up here, but I'm going to read it aloud. Thursday, the 28th of December, 1620, so many as could went to work on the hill where we purposed to build our platform for our ordinance and which doth command all the plan and the bay, and from whence we may see far into the sea, and might be easier impaled, having two rows of houses and a fair street." Now he says so many as could because many people were sickened and weakened by that original journey. They arrived in the winter of 1620, and so most people were actually living on the Mayflower while those who were able-bodied went and built rudimentary shelters. Now, it took a little while for the colony to get established. They continually faced economic setbacks, and they had a lot of issues with debt that was very, very recurring. But they ended up staying on Burial Hill, which had, as Mortz points out, a very beautiful view of the surrounding area. And that was actually used up until the 1670s during King Philip's War. After that point, it appears to have been turned into a burial ground very quickly because some of the earliest uh, stones on the burial ground actually date to the 1680s. And there may have been markers from before that that haven't survived. So, Burial Hill is, as you may have remembered, the first of the three sites that I will be talking about today. Although Burial Hill has been used primarily as a cemetery since the fort was removed, the land along School Street, which is this one right here, actually had several 18th and 19th century buildings, including a school, surprise, surprise, uh, warehouses, residences, and stables. A large town crypt constructed in 1833, which you can see in the gray right here, also impacted the archaeological site. Now recently, archaeologists from that mouthful of the Andrew Fisk <laughs> Memorial Center for Archaeological Research at the University of Massachusetts Boston discovered 17th century deposits from the original settlement on Burial Hill. In 2013 and 2014, they conducted ground penetrating re radar in order to ensure that no burials were impacted since we are right on the edge of that burial ground. 2014, they also started excavations, and 2014 and 2015, they found a good mix of 18th and 19th century materials from School Street that was also mixed with some 17th century materials. Now, when archaeologists find 17th century materials, that is uncommon enough that it says, hey, we need to look back there, and so that's what they did. Um, they also, in 2015, found a native stone tool making workshop and a possible colonial trench feature, which suggested that there may be intact areas around Burial Hill. The 2016 excavations were the first to identify intact archaeological features from the early 17th century, containing a mixture of European and native artifacts. As such, my research focuses on the 2016 to 2018 ceramics from Burial Hill, as well as the other two sites that I'll discuss. The area east of the crypt, which is this side, the side of School Street, appears to have been some sort of an outdoor space based on the features that were there. 
Now, before I go further, I just want to explain what a feature is because it's a word that's bandied about all the time by archaeologists, but I think not a lot of other people would use it the same way. So, a feature is typically defined as some sort of a soil disturbance or a marking in the soil. It's not a tangible artifact, and once you excavate it, it's destroyed. It's gone. So we have to record it very, very carefully. These are formed because there are natural layers in the soil. As soils get deposited, they form layers that kind of change in their characteristics over time. When you dig a hole, or when an animal digs a burrow, or when a tree establishes its roots, that's actually going to affect those layers, as you can see here, with the wall and mortar foundation that's dug into those layers. Then after those, that disturbance happens, that soil making process continues, and you can see new layers start to form over top of it. So what we're looking for a lot of times are nice round deposits or a nice dark pit that has filled in over time or a post when it's in the ground will rot in place and leave a nice dark stain in the ground right where it was. So those are the sorts of things that we found east of the crypt. When, when you refer to the crypt... It's this 1833 crypt right here that was built right in the middle of our site. But what do you mean by a crypt? It's a large building built into the hillside that they had had um, people in, but they were removed in the early 20th century, I want to say, but I'm not positive. Um, but it's, it was the formal sort of town burying okay. area. But yes, it's this big, large thing right here. Oh, question. And it, yes? I mean, from what I understand of crypts is sometimes they were used if the ground was frozen, to put the bodies in them in the winter, and then when spring comes, they would dig them and throw them in the ground. Or was this more permanent, for where bodies were permanently stored? You know what I mean? My understanding is that it was somewhat more permanent, and then mm -hmm. the bodies were removed all at once. But uh, I'm okay. not positive. Mm -hmm. But that's my basic understanding of what happened with that. Mm -hmm. I do know that it is no longer in use. Right. <laughs> so, the Features that were in the eastern portion of the site included a calf burial, an organic trash deposit, and a several post holes that would have been some sort of fence or boundary line. So again, not necessarily a lot of artifacts, but a lot of landscape features that suggest some sort of an outdoor space. Now, the really exciting thing comes, at least for me, because most of the ceramics that are really nice come from this area, is in 2018, where we dug to the west of the crypt and actually found a 17th century structure. This is currently being interpreted as a two-part structure. There is a cellar that was cut into the hillside, and then there are post holes level with the top of that cellar that would have gone around the cellar. So the second site that I'll be discussing before getting into all the nitty-gritty details is the Alden First Hope site. So John Alden was about 21 in 1620 when he, was, when he came to the New World on the Mayflower. He wasn't associated with the original separatists, but he decided to stay and utilize his experience as a cooper and a carpenter, ended up marrying Priscilla Mullins, and eventually helped to found the town of Duxbury, where we are now, and lived here with Priscilla and his 10 children. I have lost my mouse. That's OK. So a structure that was built by the Aldens was identified by Roland Robbins, who had been asked here by the Alden kindred of America. They knew his reputation from such sites as the Saugus Ironworks and the Walden Pond and asked him to come to see if he could find the original home. He ended up using a method that's not so common today, but it worked, where he took a metal rod and put it in the ground until he found a brick or stone foundation. He ended up finding a stone foundation 
that you can see mapped out right here with a cellar on one side and believe that the house had been moved intact to create the second album site. Now there is some debate over, here's my mouse, ah, there is some debate over whether that was actually what happened to the second site. Um, and whether there was a third home somewhere in between those two, but I'll discuss that in a moment. In the meantime, all of his work was reported to the Massachusetts Historical Commission, and they and the University of Massachusetts at Amherst ended up making a catalog of the collection. So, Mitchell Mulholland came back in 1999 to conduct a study on whether Roland Robbins' conclusions were correct. He looked at the archaeological research that had been originally done and found that there were a lot of nails that were in the original collection, which suggests that rather than being moved, the, that building rotted in place and all of those nails kind of fell in where it was. He also looked at the interior of the standing structure here and found that bits and pieces of it seemed older, but no major concentration of 17th century parts existed. So he believes that bits and pieces of that house were moved, but a lot of it had been damaged before the new house was built. Caroline Gardner also has recently done a reanalysis of this collection, and a lot of my work stems from hers, at least for the Alden site. She looked at the collection in terms of ceramics and found that there were several distinctive activity areas on the original site and also thinks that the house would have been much larger than the original foundation found. Unfortunately, Robbins didn't identify any post holes or any of those features that we were discussing earlier, so it's entirely possible that something may have been missed. And Grace Fellow, whose talk you may have seen previously, is using something called a PXRF, or Portable X-ray Fluorescence Machine, in order to read the chemical composition of glass. And in doing so, because of differences in the glass production over time, she can actually tell a date range for different types of glass, which is really nice because it helps to date archaeological sites. So this is just a rough sketch of my final site, the Allerton Prince Cushman collection. Unfortunately, this site never had a um, a report done by the original excavator, James Dietz. It does have some maps and some documentation, but a lot of what I'm working on is later analyses. So this was actually found accidentally, which is amazing, in 1972 when there was a construction done on the property. The architect who was working on the house that was being constructed was Christopher Hussey. Yes, Hussey. And he had had some close ties to Plymouth Plantation and ended up actually recognizing early 17th century materials. Now because of this, he brought these to James Dietz, who was at Plymouth Plantation at the time and is a very well-known historical archaeologist. And he, in turn, said, hey, that's something that we need to go look at. So they were racing against the clock, trying to get all of this work done before the private residence was constructed, and in the process exposed all of this. So generally, it is a stone cellar or foundation, and not lined up with that foundation is a series of post holes, the first post and ground structure that was ever identified in Massachusetts. Where is that location? Yeah. Kingston, Massachusetts. Oh, okay. But, but where in Kingston? I don't remember exactly where. It's a private residence still to this day. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so the map it looks like it was Gray's Beach area. Uh, it's unfamiliar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, well, I made that map, and I put it in the general location of Kingston. <laughs> So Dietz determined, as I was saying, that this is a posting ground structure from the 1630s. That was destroyed and a new structure was built sometime in the mid-17th century, possibly when a later occupant took over. And this is the 
ownership timeline that they came up with, Dietz and Del Upton in tandem. So Del Upton did a lot of this deed research and figured that in 1631, Allerton arrived and seems to have owned the property. Isaac Allerton departed Plymouth in 1634, and sometime between 1634 and 1648, Thomas Prince took over the property and then turned it over to Edmund Freeman of Sandwich. Unfortunately, we don't have good dates for those. Freeman sells the land to Captain Thomas Willett of Plymouth and William Patty of Boston in 1648-9, and they sell to Elder Thomas Cushman in 1653. He owns this property until 1691, at which point he unfortunately passes away and leaves the property to his son, Eliezer. Now, it's often called the Allerton site, but Cushman, of course, and the Cushman family had it for the longest period in the 17th century. And that's where I come in. So, there was some work done on the Allerton site, uh, Craig Chartier in particular has done a reanalysis of the Allerton site, but a lot of that work still needs to be done, and additionally the work at Burial Hill needs to be put together, basically. So, that's what I am doing here. This is a single vessel, but it's broken into a whole lot of pieces. When archaeological remains are found, usually they look something like this. We don't usually get the nice stuff. We don't get the things that are intact, because the things that are useful, the things that are valuable, are things that people want to hold on to and keep using. So we get the broken pots that have been thrown out in the backyard for us to find later. Now these pots can break into either two or 200 pieces, you never know. So while it can be helpful to look at the number of sherds or pieces that you have, a really helpful way of analyzing this is by looking at what's called a minimum number of vessels. And that is where you take all of these sherds in your collection, you organize them by type, so basically where they came from, what they look like, uh, what, who was potting them, and then you pick out all of the distinctive bits and pieces. So, for instance, a rim or a foot ring or some sort of handle, and you count all of those up and figure out how many distinctive pieces you have. So if I cut up this water bottle, if I have just bits and pieces of all these little body bits, that's not helpful. But if I have five bottle caps, I know I have at least five vessels. That's kind of the idea. So this is a single vessel, and we're lucky enough that all of these actually go back together. Putting them together is like a yard sale puzzle where it's in the wrong box and you've got other puzzles mixed in. Uh, but I pulled a lot of these out with some help, and our conservator at UMass Boston is actually in the process of putting it back together. So he just sent me these pictures, and you can see that almost all of those shirts form a single vessel. So if I had all of these shirts and I only had two shirts of another vessel, if I just used those shirt counts, it would look really off. Mm -hmm. Now with the shirt counts, I hope you can all see this. It does look a little bit small on that screen, I'm sorry. But we have a total of 30 vessels for Burial Hill. Now of those, one vessel is possibly just coarse earthenware. Some vessel types are really similar to each other, so it's a little bit tricky to tell sometimes. Three of those vessels are from Germany, one is from France, and then 11 are from England. I also have this category, European Other, because redware in particular is very common in a lot of different places and also in a lot of different time periods. So you may have redware in your backyard today in the form of a flower pot. I'm sure you can all picture exactly what it is now. <laughs> Tin glaze also is very, very common. It was made in Italy, France, the Netherlands, England, Spain, uh, Turkey, all over the place. 
And because of that, and because a lot of the potters were moving from country to country, many people were copying each other, shipping clay from one place to another. So that one's also a little tricky to tell unless it has some sort of distinctive characteristic to it. In your definition of ceramics? Yes. <clears throat> would that include a ceramic overlay to a metal? I have not seen that for this time period. So this is pure ceramics, not, not a glaze, not, not something over a, a metal object? No, okay. not for this time period, okay. not that I've seen. So I've got a breakdown here just to make it a little bit easier to see the countries of origin for those ceramics without the wear types. And those are very, very biased towards that European other category. Redwares in particular are really, really common on 17th century sites. Uh, they're utilitarian wares, they're used for your dairying, they're used for cooking, they're used for storage, and because of that you're going to find a lot of it. The other thing to keep in mind is that this doesn't represent other vessels such as pewter, which were very common at the time, and also wood, because neither of those survives well archaeologically. So to make it even easier to see the countries of origin, I just went ahead and pulled out those European others, and you can see that 69% of all of these ceramics at Burial Hill are English. And then the other 30% are made up of German, French, and the Netherlands wares. The Alden first site, I have pulled a couple of vessels out because they were very clearly later. They weren't produced in the 17th century. But for all of these 17th century vessels, we have one from China, which we did not find at Burial Hill, 17 from England, five from Germany, one from Spain, and then 24 for those European others, which again is very dominated by red wares. Now the Chinese one in particular is really interesting. It's possible that this comes from a slightly later context or that it's associated with John Alden, but if it is, then it would have been very much a status item, something that was either given to him because of his role in the colony or that he had purchased himself to sort of display and to value. Would have been a very sad day when that broke either way. <laughs> so again, the European other dominates, but if we go ahead and take that out, almost the same breakdown for English to non-English, 71% English ceramics, 21% German, and then 4% Chinese and Spanish, which represents one vessel each. Finally, we have the Allerton Prince Cushman ceramics. This one has a substantially larger vessel count than the other two, and it actually had some errors with the original vessel list, so I've had to pare that down from an identified 118 originally, because somebody was splitting them up very generously, and unfortunately, there were a couple of errors with it. So here we have 19 English wares, two French wares, five German wares, one Italian ware, and then 56 European other. So a lot of those are milk pans, storage jars, things like that. Again, with and without European other. So England, once again, 70% of our total here, which makes sense because it is an English colony. And then you have German as the second largest, and then Italian and French. So, the big question is how did these get here? It's possible that many of these were acquired from London directly, particularly during provisioning expeditions back to London. But a lot of that was disrupted in 1642, and there's evidence from a variety of other colonies that this, the English Civil War actually caused a kind of a hands-off approach on all the colonists who started establishing trade networks from other places. It's possible that these came <coughs> from Dutch travelers. The Dutch in particular were traveling to a variety of different ports and they were buying goods, they were selling them elsewhere, they were the Amazon of their time. <laughs> and this comes from Bradford here. 
And this year in the spring came in a Dutchman who thought to have traded at the Dutch fort, but they would not have him because he wasn't part of the Dutch East India Company. He, having a good store of trading goods, came to this place and tendered them to sell, of whom they bought a good quantity, they being very good and fit for their turn, as Dutch wool, kettles, etc., which goods amounted to the value of 500 pounds. So that's a pretty substantial purchase. It's also possible that some of these goods came from New Amsterdam. Again, Bradford records several visits and letters from <clears throat> excuse me, from New Amsterdam, such as this one here, which comes from a letter in the appendix of my copy, actually. And if it so fall out that any goods that come to our hands from our native country may be serviceable unto you, we shall take ourselves bound to help and accommodate you therewith, either for beaver or any other wares or merchandise that you should be pleased to deal for. So that's pretty explicitly saying, hey, New Amsterdam here, we would love to trade with you. And then it's also possible that these come directly from the country of origin. So one of the things that if you go to the archaeological exhibit here that you might see is the Iberian storage vessel. And this is a mended vessel that was actually found during the Alden first site excavation. A lot of times these storage vessels were used to ship goods across the ocean from Spain, uh, particularly liquids such as olive oil, and because of that, it seems as though that would have come from Spain to here, and then whoever bought it, probably Alden, then kept it to use for later. And then there are also records, again in Bradford, of shipwrecks such as French and Dutch shipwrecks, so it seems that there were several other ships that were in the area. Now a lot of the English response to this was based in mercantilism. So they believed that the government needed to increase regulation on shipping and create a bureaucracy in order to enhance state power through trade. They particularly argued against the selling of raw materials and you can see evidence of this in the <coughs> excuse me in the shipment of wool. So in the 1640s, wool was about 80 to 90 percent of England's exports, and by the 1690s, it was down to about 40 percent. So that's a substantial drop off. In the meantime, they decided to focus more on producing finished goods to prevent people from buying their raw materials, producing finished goods, and then selling them back to them at a profit. And they believed that we had to export more than we import in order to create a positive cash flow. So in order to do this, they created a variety of measures. Um, probably one of the more famous ones is the Navigation Act, beginning in 1651. This targeted a lot of international trade by requiring people to stop at English ports before trading any international goods, particularly finished products. There was also the Anglo-Dutch Wars. Uh, the Dutch were a particular target of the English because many people believed that they were abusing their rights to the English fishing waters and also, again, creating finished goods and selling them back at a massive upcharge. The Dutch money was actually also worth substantially more than English money because it had a much higher um, buying metals content. And because of that, a lot of people would trade with the Dutch and then melt down that money and then remint it into English currency. <laughs> So, the English weren't too happy with the Dutch, and it caused a lot of conflicts. They also reduced the export of raw materials, which tangentially leads into the triangular trade because they're trying to get raw materials from their own colonies, produce those as finished goods, and of course, use enslaved labor from Africa in order to do it. <coughs> and then there's evidence that the pesky Dutch were actually circumventing a lot of these restrictions. Particularly in Jamestown, it appears that a lot of the Dutch shipments 
were bypassing Jamestown and going to hinterland settlers directly and trading with these plantations that were spread out. Now, one thing I haven't talked about, which is a very big gap in this research, is the role of Native Americans. Of course, if you're looking at European ceramics, that's not going to be super visible. And not only that, but a lot of the things that the Native Americans were trading with the English colonists were being shipped overseas, such as beaver furs. However, there is a lot of documentary evidence for the role that Native Americans played. There is evidence of the establishment of wampum as a currency between the Plymouth colonists and the Native peoples. There is also archaeological materials that have probably been labeled as pre-European. That was very common in the 20th century and a lot of new research is being done on some of those older collections to try to establish if that took place. Uh, one of those is actually Kelly Bauer's 2015 thesis, Native Interactions and Economic Exchange, a reevaluation of Plymouth Colony collections. And that looks at some of the trade items that were very commonly used and that had been identified as European or as pre-European, but probably were actually trade goods between the Native peoples and Europeans. And then some of the next steps in my research is to perform statistical analyses to see whether some of these similarities or differences between the different sites are statistically significant, and also to compare Plymouth Colony to other English 17th century colonial sites. So I mentioned Jamestown a lot, they've done a lot of research on this, and it appears that they have almost twice as many wear types identified as we do in Plymouth, at least for the sites that I've looked at so far. Now this is possibly due to a lot more work being done on the Jamestown Colony sites, at least as far as identifying very specific wear types. It's possible that they've identified really distinct subcategories that I just haven't been able to get my hands on a nice sample of. And it's also possible that Jamestown had a lot more resources than Plymouth, which was very debt-ridden for much of its existence. So that's one of the things that I would like to investigate further. In the meantime, thank you very much for coming. <laughs>
or whether those predate the European colonists, but especially at uh, Barrow Hill, where there was definitely some sort of native occupation in the area, um, it's, it could go either way, unfortunately. <laughs> But um, as far as European-made ceramics that were local, those don't come until a little bit later. The Charlestown um, ceramics, the potters up in Charlestown in particular, in the late 17th century, I didn't find anything like that. Um, you do find it in Boston, though, quite often. I was thinking, um, I know that the Pilgrims had built a storehouse initially when they first landed as a place to put the items that were going to take off the boat. And they also, I think, crashed there while they were trying to build their huts or cottages. But do they know where that storehouse was built? And if they did, you would think there'd be some pretty cool artifacts around that. A lot of downtown Plymouth has been built up in the exact same location mm -hmm. for so long. Mm -hmm. So the reason that we were able to find Burial Hill is because we actually did years of research into different areas that may possibly have had some sort of intact archaeological features. Because once you build something into the ground, it destroys all of that archaeology, unfortunately. So because it's been built up so much over time, all that we're finding are kind of little pockets here and there of mm. intact things. So we looked at uh, Carver Street, at a lot in Carver Street. There wasn't anything intact there from the 17th century. Um, did extensive work in Brewster Gardens as well, and there wasn't anything there that had actually been really heavily landscaped, and before that it was an industrial center. So unfortunately, we can't find too much. We are trying though. Yeah, I think there's a sign at the bottom of Leiden Street that either says this is where the first cottages were built or this is where the first storehouse is built. I haven't gone and seen that, but the theory would be at the bottom of Leiden Street might have been where the first storehouse So was. the problem with a lot of those signs is that they were placed um, in the general area of yeah. where it might have been, yeah. but we don't have enough good documentation to say for sure. Yeah. So for the Burial Hill site, we don't even know who lived there for sure. It could be any one of three people who are recorded as being in the area at mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. So the, there are impediments to your further discovery of, of stuff. Yes, very much so. But, but, but can you surmise whether technology now or in the future can, you know, go underneath and, and you know, there's a lot of stuff that's being done right now with mm -hmm. oceanography and I just wonder whether that might be in the future. So one of the problems with that is that a lot of the things that we're looking at are either very ephemeral, such as those mm. soil stains in the ground, or are very small. Mm. So ground penetrating radar will look at really big things, so we can use it to identify those possible mm. um, unmarked burials, but even then, we don't know for sure whether that's what those anomalies are. It's just not precise enough to find a site that's as ephemeral as this. Now for the Alms site, because it was stone, maybe, but that's a large intact stone feature in the ground. Most of what we're finding is wooden posts that were stuck in the ground that rotted in place and left a soil stain. So there's still very much a need for what's called ground truthing. Yeah. Oh, near where you were um, digging, I know there was the Alden marker that says this is the site where John Alden lived. Is there anything other than that marker that could tie John Alden within the confines of where you were digging? Or? So Alden's one of the three possibilities. Um, Miles Standish also could be there. And then I forget if it's Souther or Holmes first, but one of them was in between the two and then sold it to the other one. Um, I have that written down in my notes, but it's really far back. Um, okay. But yeah, so it's believed that Alden would have been the furthest to the east, and then Standish would have been the closest to the fort, and then the home southern lot was in between the two. Um, but where exactly that was on the landscape, we can't say for sure. Hmm. I know there's some speculation that that building may be Standish's, but it's really, we, 
we probably will never be able to say for sure unless we find something that says John Alden was here, which would be amazing. It would make my entire life. I can throw it. J. A. Cufflink, yeah. It's it's gonna say John loves Priscilla. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> of course, yes. Where, where is that first Alden site? Uh, the first Alden home site is actually just across the way in a playing field. So there's a path, if it were light out, that leads down to it. From that way? Yeah. yeah. Thanks. I've only been here a couple times, so I know it's behind me. Yeah, somewhere. it's over there. But it was filled in, so to prevent any further, uh, I guess, digging from locals or anybody else. Yes, so and it's, it's fenced off now, and it's got a marker. It's very nice. So uh, after analyzing the artifacts from the three sites, is there did uh, anything that you found um, surprise you, or did it kind of confirm what you thought going in as far as the origin of the pieces and? So the prevalence of English ceramics is very, very common, and it makes a lot of sense because this was an English colony. I think. I was a little bit surprised by the bits and pieces like the Italian marble slip, which is absolutely beautiful, the Chinese porcelain, um, just finding a lot of these evidence of trade from elsewhere going on. I also, before this, worked on a lot of 18th and 19th century ceramics, so I'm used to having a very nice tight date range of, oh, this arrived here, you know, within this 10 year time period. And that's not the case in the 17th century, particularly in New England. We don't know exactly when things arrived. We don't know exactly what the date range is for it in New England. So adjusting to that time period and to a different method of research was a little bit tricky, but I think I've got the hang of it. <laughs> so, so the ceramics you're describing, where are they located? So the ceramics from the Adelton Prince Cushman site are at Plymouth Plantation, and for the other two sites, they're at UMass Boston right now. Do you have access to chemical analysis, particularly for elements that might help determine where these came from? I would think the clays would be a little bit different depending on where. Sometimes, but for the ones that I would really like to do that on, like the tin glaze, some people were shipping the clays from place to place. And also, you need to have a sample from the original clay deposit. So even if it's from this particular region, if I don't know where exactly that clay came from, I can maybe get it close. I am looking at doing some sort of an inclusion or a chemical analysis to see whether it would be feasible to compare that possible Dutch coarse earthenware to borderware. But that depends on whether there would be any chemical differences between the two. And it seems like right now it would be better and easier to look at it through a microscope and then qualitatively describe differences between the ceramics to say, yes, this is borderware, or no, it's actually Dutch. So it's all dependent on what's the best tool for the job. So. Um with any of the sh ships or vessels that were trading, did they, would the ship manifest include things of lists of what they were importing or trading that would include your, your wear, any of your wear? This is one of the most heartbreaking questions of my research. <laughs> so the port records for English colonies, they're not super well intact. They're also in London, oh. and they're not digitized. So I would love access to them, if only to see what was there. Um, also, if people are circumventing English rules, they're also circumventing English customs. And so archaeology is still a good way, in combination with the documentary research, to determine what's going on. So the original um, Mayflower passengers had to have brought stuff with them, you know, that they mm -hmm. would be able to use for cooking or storage or dinnerware or something. I don't think they were eating with their hands either. Well, something <laughs> <laughs> But is there any evidence of that original uh, contents of, of <coughs> No, not to my knowledge. There's um, 
not a whole lot described. It's like if you go on a trip, you're not necessarily going to describe everything you're bringing with you. Mm -hmm. You're going to describe where you went and what you did and who you saw. And that's a lot of what you have in the original documents as well. You mentioned the second Pierce patent. What is a patent and, and what does that mean in general? So the patents are kind of their permission to establish a settlement. So the first patent was saying, you can go and stay with Virginia as an enclave of that group. Because they settled outside of Virginia, they needed to petition for a new patent in order to get permission to stay where they currently were. From England. From England. Um, usually they establish partnerships with trading companies. So the New England, um, New England Company, I forget the exact name of it, is who gave the second Pierce patent. And the East India Company, I believe, gave the first one, or the Virginia Company, rather. Yeah, I think the king used to uh, sign the patents himself, and then he delegated it to these corporations. And then the corporations would issue the patents on his behalf. So if you had to describe a you know, 17th century dwelling when you walked in, how would you describe it in terms of the ceramics? Like in terms of the ceramics? Um, so Caroline actually did a really great job of this. Um, unfortunately, because uh, some of the sites that I'm looking at are highly disturbed or are, have really poor records, I can't do as much spatial analysis as she did, so I'm going to pull from her a bit for this answer. Um, but they had some distinct activity areas. Dairying was really important. There's been a couple of articles and a thesis on dairying in Plymouth Colony. Um, so they would have had an area set aside for your butter jars, for your milk pans, for anything that would have allowed them to create different products from that. They also would have had a storage area that they would have used ceramics for, for either storing uh, liquids or solids in order to last them through the winter. And then the plates and bowls and things like that more often would have been larger serving vessels um, with some individual vessels, but that doesn't really come until the Georgian period. And then a lot of the vessels, as I believe I mentioned earlier, were actually wood or pewter. And unfortunately, we don't have evidence of that because neither of those things really survive archaeologically. Pewter seldom does, and wood needs exactly the right conditions, which you don't normally find in New England. Any other questions? <laughs>